Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. It's always like it's brand new, so powerful. We thank you that you're always there and that you wait for us. Your long suffering is part of what we need, and we just pray that we will not take advantage of your weight. Help us, Lord, to sense that time is slipping by. Help us to understand there are things that need to be done. We thank you for the grace of Jesus and his life. And we just pray that we may attach to it more closely, that we may sense what your mind is really seeking. We thank you now for this time. We pray that we may use it wisely. We pray for your guidance in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I haven't seen you since last year. <laughs> I said that to my daughter just the other day, and she said, well, that wasn't so long ago. <laughs> she didn't think it was funny at all. <laughs> well, we are beginning a new year. I suppose as far as the planets and all that are concerned, they don't care. But we get a chance to look at it as a new beginning again. And I'm glad that we have this once a year to really start projecting ahead. We have last year to look at, and it doesn't seem to matter how much we try, we always find something we didn't like happened last year. <laughs> There's always something there we wish we'd done another way. <laughs> Well, we have a new year now, and we get another chance. <laughs> this year, uh, we want to focus ourselves a little bit tighter. We've been talking about soul winning and some of the things behind that and how to approach it the way God wants us to approach it. And I think we've opened some doors, but we're, uh, we're still needing to move out some more. And we want to talk as we go along here about praise and what ha that has to do with witnessing. How, how do we praise God? Do we feel praise? <laughs> Is this something that's in us? Thanksgiving. We want to talk about adoration. Do we do that? <laughs> in today's society where things are so cold and so callous, do we even know what it means to adore? And of course, I don't mean human beings because that's not right. We shouldn't adore human beings. <laughs> but we're talking about the real thing, about adoring God, the only one that's worthy. Well, let's begin today by looking at Selected Messages, Volume 3. And about page 195, I'll have to see exactly where I want to begin here. Yeah, that's, that's it, 195. This little section begins with the statement, A general faith is entertained by many and their assent is given that Christianity is the only hope of perishing souls. But to believe this intellectually is not sufficient for the saving of the soul. Well, if faith in the mind is not enough, <laughs> then what do we need besides faith? Naked faith by itself isn't going to get us anything. That's why I really have to back up when people say that they are saved by faith alone. Well, I, I think I understand what they're saying. But if you take that statement all the way to the end, well, faith is not enough. 
<laughs> See? Faith, in addition to faith, faith doing something, faith having a result, has to be able to trust. See? So it's just not believing in something. It's giving yourself <laughs> all the way to it in trust. So this is what we want to start looking at, is how does that trust show itself? How does it feel? <laughs> how does it work in the life? What does it do? I want to read a little sentence here that fits right here at this place of trust. It's about Abraham. It's kind of a startling statement, I think, but I want to read it and let's see what we do. Abraham was saved by faith in Christ as verily as the sinner is saved by faith in Christ today. Now, Abraham was in the Old Testament, wasn't he? <laughs> I hear a lot about the Old Testament's about works and the New Testament's about faith. But you know, I haven't found a single person in the Old Testament I haven't found a single person in the patriarchal age. I haven't found a single person all the way back to Adam who isn't saved by faith. <laughs> it's not possible to have salvation without faith and trust in God. So that's a statement you might want to remember sometimes. Somebody's talking to you. Abraham was saved the same way we are. <laughs> The same issues. All right. Continuing then. When John wrote down for us the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. When's the last time you stopped to think about those two words? Taketh away. What is in those two words? <laughs> What's it mean? Taketh away. <laughs> well, let's see what the spirit of prophecy has recorded for us. There is a great deal in the taketh away. The question is, Shall we keep on sinning as though it were an impossibility for us to overcome? That's a big question. That's the $64 question. Have we run that through our mind? Have we come up with an answer? Uh, are we out there sitting stunned saying, well, uh, I'm not sure. What, is that? what happens here? <laughs> That's a question we are supposed to know the answer to. <laughs> after we become Christians, after we have received Jesus Christ, after we have the Spirit of God, do we know what the Bible is telling us when it says, taketh away sin? <laughs> No, I understand. You, they may not have covered this during the evangelistic meetings. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> okay? And I understand that pastors do not have time to cover this every week in the sermon. <laughs> but you don't need pastors and you don't need evangelists after you're a Christian to be a Christian. You only need Jesus. <laughs> and you have the Bible. You have the Spirit of God. You have everything you need to know the answers to the questions he asks. <laughs> you just need to spend a little bit of time like I need to spend a little bit of time. <laughs> we need to sit down with the books. We need to pray. We need to ask the Lord to reveal things to us so that when he throws a question like this, 
Shall we keep on sinning as though it were any possibility for us to overcome? <laughs> and we don't need an intellectual answer here. This is not a quiz. <laughs> we need to know for sure in our mind and our heart that the answer we give is the one we believe and the one we're going to live. All right, I'm going to read the rest of the sentence now. <laughs> How are we to overcome? I'm quoting now. As Christ overcame, and that is the only way. He prayed to his heavenly Father. We can do the same. And they say, well, that was too simple. <laughs> I mean, that's all there is? <laughs> well, what did Jesus do? <laughs> did he become a theologian? I don't think so. <laughs> Did he go out and argue with people? Huh? Did he go study in the library? Did he go ask a pastor? I mean, look at the life of Jesus. He only did one thing. He talked to his father. And so we have been trying to lead into that here for the last couple times. Our Heavenly Father, do you remember the scripture that we dealt with the entire time last time? John 14, 23. If a man will keep my words, the Father will love him. We will come unto him, the Father and the Son. We will come unto him and make our abode in him. The Father is not a billion miles away from us. <laughs> we don't have to try to reach out to the throne somewhere in the middle of who knows where. The Father sends his spirit and Jesus comes also, and they abide in us. They take up residence in us. They're right there. <laughs> okay? So don't go thinking about the big universe and how far things are. <laughs> Heaven is right with you. You don't have to go anyplace. <laughs> you don't even have to look around. <laughs> you know, I, I've had all kinds of people in my lifetime tell me the same thing over and over again. Oh, I can't pray. I can't pray. My prayers don't go past the ceiling. I, I just know they're not going anywhere. And I look at them, I say, well, why do they have to go anywhere? <laughs> I say, you know, if God seems far away, guess who moved? <laughs> That's the truth, because God didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Jesus prayed to his Father. You pray to your Father. He's right there. And whatever happened in Jesus' life because of that is going to happen in your life the same way. <laughs> you have to count on it. <laughs> because Jesus, by his blood, has bought the right to have you 
come in his name. He wants you to be a name dropper. <laughs> he says, you say my name. You use my name. You put my name in front of you. Go in my name. The Father loves it. <laughs> All right, we're not done with this sunset. When tempted to speak wrong and do wrong, resist Satan and say, oh, I forgot to put that in blue. I have all of these says in blue in my computer. Say, all right, here's what you can say. And say it. Don't just think it. Say it. I will not surrender my will to your control. <laughs> That's what you say to Satan. <laughs> now you better know that when you say that, there's something behind you. <laughs> and when you see that funny look on Satan's face looking at you, it's not because he's looking at you, he sees what's behind you. <laughs> Yeah, James said that. He said, you draw nigh to God, you resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But it's not you resisting the devil by yourself. It's the Father and you by the grace of Christ. And so... We need to understand these things and work them and do them and sense what's happening with them so that when we're talking to people without our ever getting into any of this, they know there's something more going on that you're not talking about. Yeah, they know it. They cannot figure it out, but they know this is not just talk. <laughs> there's something going on in this life. That's beyond this life. And they're going to want to know what it is. <laughs> yeah. They're going to want to know, how do I get that? All right, let me finish the sentence now. I will cooperate with divine power and through grace be conqueror. There it is. This is 3SM. 195. Well, let's see. Where am I here? Oh, this just knocked out my entire program. Okay, I'll have to put another one in here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to volume 8 of the testimonies. Somewhere around... page 21 to 25. Volume 8, page 21 to 25. Okay. I'm going to start reading on page 24. So you can read the other parts. On this... In this little section, the subject is the remnant church. So we know who that is. In the first sentence of this section, she says, the condition of the remnant church is appalling. Now, we don't read this to be discouraged. We want to know what the problem is so we get out of it. <laughs> okay? It's no good to read this material and say, oh, woe is us. Look how miserable we are. 
That's not what it's for. It's to help us understand not, not only where we are, how we got there, and then how to get out of it. Okay. So the Lord is merciful to us. We have the third angel's message, and the third angel's message is for a reason. It's to be given. <laughs> the Lord does not give us a message so that we can put it in our pocket and, <laughs> and say, oh boy, I have a message. <laughs> She begins by talking about looking around, and I can imagine what she went through in her lifetime looking at the people. She looked around, and what did she see? Did she see people out there going every place in every direction trying to save souls? <laughs> That's not the picture she got at all. She saw people just sitting around. People that God called to be missionaries, to win souls, to love. But that is not what she saw. So she said, well, uh, how my heart aches, she says. My heart aches looking at all of this unchristlike behavior. Not like Jesus at all. She said, but after the agony is passed, after I look and this happens to me, she says, and I realize I've got to do something to arouse these people. <laughs> so she never just sat there and said, we have a terrible problem. It always struck her, I need to do something now. I see it, I need to do something. I must arouse them to put forth unselfish effort for the saving of their fellow men. Arouse them to be unselfish. Help them understand they are stewards. I don't know what kind of a picture hits you when that word steward comes around. Usually it comes out dollar signs, but that's not what the word means. <laughs> it means somebody has put you in their place to do something that they would do if they were around. You are doing their, their thing instead of them. So we are stewards of divine grace. God has us here to do what he can't do so people can see him doing it. You're the only one they can see. So we are stewards. And then she tells a story. I'm going to try to capsulize it here. She says, imagine... A, a big place, an island like, like Britain. And they have been cut off. And they can't get any food. They can't get any supplies. They can't get anything. They're just there. And after a while, these people are really in trouble. I mean, they don't have any excess of water to drink. They don't have any food. They can't go to the store. The stores don't have food. They're getting sick, and they're really in bad shape. And someone decides they're going to go ahead and, and make a way to send them some food. They're going to get a convoy, and they're going to supply it and send it over there and be sure it gets in. And so they arrange this. And they get the captain and the ships and all the supplies. And all of this starts going over there towards Britain. But somewhere along the line, it's, it's going to take a little while, you know. In the old days, it didn't happen in a week or two. <laughs> it took a while to get someplace. On the way, the crew members began to not worry about it too much. <laughs> they were eating. <laughs> yeah, <I> see. <laughs> and so the boats are going along. And as time went on, uh, they were getting less and less concerned about all these starving people over in that island. 
And as time went on, it was just a job then. Well, on the way, they ran into some islands in the South Seas. And they said, why don't we stop here for a little bit? <laughs> and so they stopped the boats. <laughs> and they got off on the islands. And they thought it was rather pleasant. I said, well, we don't have to rush, do we? We've got all these supplies in this ship. So they unloaded some of the supplies, and they sat there, and they were eating all this stuff and having a good time and, and just enjoying these islands. Well, you get the point. I'm not going to continue this story. I'm going to get back into what, what is happening here in the Spirit Prophecy. It says, they entered into a temptation, and it grew stronger, and their selfish spirit gained possession of their minds. Now, I want you to get that. Their selfish spirit gained possession of their minds. Their, their original purpose of mercy fades from their sight. They forget the starving people to whom they were sent. And that which was entrusted to them is used for their own benefit. She says, think of the horror of human beings dying because those placed in charge of the means of relief proved unfaithful to their trust. Now, we can sit here and look at that story and say, that's absolutely horrible. How could they be so miserable? How could they do such a thing? I'm instructed to say to you, my brother and my sister, that Christians are daily repeating this sin. <laughs> yeah, God put us out on a trip of mercy. He gave us all the supplies. He said, go, they're starving to death. And what happened? It's a real jar, isn't it? We don't think of ourselves as bad people, but this is a horrible, horrendous sin. Now, God's not going to keep us out of the kingdom for that. <laughs> because we are weak, miserable little things, <laughs> and we're trying, but he's, he wants to wake us up. And we're not going to get awakened to say, well, I will do it now, because you didn't do it before when you said you were going to do it. <laughs> it takes more than saying, I'm going to do it. So God knows he's got to move into an area of which we want to begin probing so that our hearts become so thankful we can't help it. <laughs> when we get to the place, we are so grateful. When we love to such an extent that it's going to spill over. That's what God wants. That's who Jesus was. And when we glibly say, I want to be like Jesus, well, that's who Jesus is. <laughs> He lived all the time to save somebody. So this is kind of an interesting place that we've come into here, volume eight of the testimonies. She backs up a little bit and then talks about Israel. The Lord chose a people. He chose a people. He made them depositories of this salvation for the world. Israel, his people. I'm going to start reading again. 
This is on 25. It says, but Israel. Oh, that but. Have you ever noticed what comes after that isn't usually very good? <laughs> oh, it, just, it just stuns you when that but comes around. <laughs> Here it comes. But Israel did not fulfill God's purpose, they forgot God. Now, I want to ask you, did they go to church? <laughs> did they do the sacrifices? Did they pay their tithe? What does it mean they forgot God? They did everything people do in church. <laughs> so, you mean you can do everything that church people do and still have completely forgotten about God well I didn't write this <laughs> I'm just reading but I know this is true they forgot God now, remember that ship. What did they forget? <laughs> they forgot all those starving people they were supposed to be helping. <laughs> all right, we're talking about Israel. The blessings that they had received brought no blessings to the world. Oh, they got blessings. <laughs> they knew the plan of salvation. They knew about Jesus. And they put a wall around it. And said, so you guys are sinners. <laughs> yeah. You guys are sinners. You don't, you don't deserve any of this. Then it says... They robbed God. They robbed God of the service he required of them. Now that is a very difficult sentence. You mean all those church people were robbers? <laughs> yes, all those church people were robbers. They robbed God. What did they rob him of? The service that they volunteered for? No, that isn't what it said. The service that he required of them. So they didn't even do what he said. They robbed him instead. Israel. They robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. Now, is that why you joined the church? So that everybody that you knew before you joined the church would now know you're different. <laughs> You are going to present a holy example to them. <laughs> that doesn't mean a holier than thou attitude. It means you're really connected. <laughs> a holy example. God finally said his son. <laughs> we can all see how that's necessary, can't we? <laughs> God finally sent his son to reveal the character of the father before men. Now, we're getting a little bit ahead of the story here. You remember that Jesus said, as the father sent me, so I send you. So we are the visible representation of the character of God now to people. We didn't become Christians to sit down on a bench. 
You know, it's a little more comfortable when we're sharing with each other, but that's not where we're supposed to live. <laughs> we're supposed to be going, doing. We'll, we'll come back to that. Christ came and lived. Christ came and lived on this earth a life of obedience to God's law. Now please remember that the next time somebody tells you the law was done away with at the cross. Because it never occurred to them that Jesus didn't do anything against the law. He lived the law perfectly. And if they say to you, well, he did it, I don't have to. <laughs> you better know what you're talking to. The carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God. So you better know, here's a person that really needs some help. You need to pray with them, for them, with them. <laughs> you need to start doing something here. This person has been sold a bill of goods. So the church, the church was freighted. You get a picture with that word freighted? Yeah, those ships were freighted. The church is freighted with food for the starvation of souls. So that little story that Ellen White told about Britain is not a really a story at all. It's the truth. People are starving. And God has given us the food to help them. What happens if we don't give it to them? Yeah, this is what the Lord is trying to stir us up to understand. If he can't use us, who is he going to use? The Israel church, God gave them a treasure to give to the world. Gave them a treasure. Did they do it? We know the history, don't we? And we say, those miserable people. Oh, those terrible Jews. <laughs> be careful what you're saying about those people. <laughs> yeah, be careful. You know, God has told us, the way you judge others is the way I'm going to judge you. I'm going to use that standard because you seem to think that's fair. Have you ever criticized somebody behind their back? Well, don't wait because God's going to use it on you. He has promised. What you do is going to come back to you. Do you see what's wrong with people telling people the church is Babylon? Oh, they're going to pay for that one. That's horrible. I try to warn as many people as I can who are doing that. You better start thinking about something else. It's coming around. Next time you holler at the gas station attendant because he spilled gas on your fender, think about it. <laughs> Someday he might tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, I needed somebody to be kind to me that day. <laughs> Christ ascended to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit. 
Now, I didn't write that sentence, <laughs> so don't run the theologian on me. <laughs> Christ sent His Holy Spirit to give power to the work and so forth. In a single generation, the, His Spirit, His Holy Spirit in those people who He first pulled. And by the way, they were not doctor degrees. <laughs> they were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were... How come he chose them instead of the intelligentsia, the, the refined, cultured ones of society? He said why. He couldn't put the new wine in those old bottles. They were too smart for the new wine. And so he took people who would say, okay, tell us more. <laughs> and the new wine went in new bottles. And they turned the known world upside down in their generation. Yeah, you think about that. A handful of people. <laughs> one generation. Do you think we can do it in one generation? <laughs> We've got a lot more tools. <laughs> But what we need is some people. <laughs> you have to start it with something. <laughs> All right, here's where I was headed for, because I didn't write this. But little by little, a change came. The church lost her first love. She became selfish. Selfish. What does that mean, selfish? That means my life comes first, and then I'll think about the rest of this. <laughs> Poor people, yeah, I know we got poor people, and after I pay all of my bills and I do everything I need to do, uh, show me one. <laughs> Selfish. Uh, what do you mean there's something over here that's a worthy cause? I've been saving to buy this for a long time. <laughs> I won't go on. I mean, it gets too horrible to think about. It's all of us. We get selfish because we are selfish without this love for God first. Now, it's not a hopeless situation or he wouldn't be telling us any of this. <laughs> he says, you can get over here where I want you to be. <laughs> All right, they were selfish. Well, after they became selfish, what came next? They became ease-loving. Oh, I bought me a big chair, and I'm going to sit in it. <laughs> ease-loving. I'm going to sit here and get entertained. I want to be amused. Let's have a party. <laughs> Selfish, ease loving. The spirit of worldliness was cherished. Yeah, it became like everybody else. But they throw in a little bit of church too, you know. Save Saturdays for God. The enemy cast a spell upon them. 
Oh, folks, is she describing the remnant church or isn't she? Now, don't look around. I mean, <laughs> remnant church. <laughs> I know what all this means. <laughs> yeah. What happened? The church left their first love. Do you remember the first love? And I'm saying it that way because I'm not going to ask you, do you have your first love right now? I'm going to ask you, do you remember your first love? Because you, you have had the experience. You know it. What is the first love? What happens in the first love? Jeremiah, oh, it burns in my bones. It burns in my bones. <laughs> For the Bible, show me something else. Let me see. Give me that book. <laughs> I'm going to make me a Bible study here. <laughs> I, there's somebody I want to talk to. <laughs> Who's that somebody? All my relatives. <laughs> all the people I work with oh I'm going to grab them off the street <laughs> the first love <laughs> oh let me get around my brothers and sisters I can't give enough of tell me about the end times oh tell me about this oh let's talk about who we are as a church let's get into our history <laughs> I can't get enough. <laughs> First love. But something happened. Happens to everybody that's not watching, and I think it happens to everybody, period. Instead of looking at Jesus and talking to the Father, they start looking around to see what the other church members are doing so they can do the same thing. And you know what? You couldn't look at a worse thing, for an example. <laughs> I did it. I know all about it. <laughs> yeah. Some of it hit me in the face, but I did it. I looked. The first thing I ever looked at was a church social. I had no idea such a thing existed. I didn't see that in the Bible. <laughs> but I was invited to one, and the first thing they poked in my face was a bowl of ice cream. And the next thing I saw was a deck of cards. And I left. I could not reconcile the voice I'd heard with this. And you have to know, it took a toll on me. It had an effect. <laughs> I didn't give up God. <laughs> but I had to wonder, what is this I've joined? Well, God has a church. He has faithful ones. But let me tell you, what's out in the front today on a majority basis is not them. Now, don't go looking around. That's not why we're saying this. We're saying this so that you don't look around. <laughs> it's too awful. Stay with Jesus. He's going to make it come out. He has a real church. He's drawing through all of this. You be one of those. No matter what. You know, you can get a 300-member church down your back really easy by being faithful. Well, if that happens ever to you, you be faithful. Because God needs that one person in there to leaven that group. <laughs> I've heard it said the other way. The people who see the problem but don't know the answer say, get out of there. They're going to leaven you. <laughs> don't listen to error. Well, wait a minute. They got as much error as anybody. 
No, you be the leaven. Don't be leavened. You be the leaven. Wherever you go, you be the one that the Lord can use because you're listening and you want to do what's right and it burns in your bones to do righteousness, to live the life of Jesus. There's a world unwarned, a world unsaved. And you don't have to go very far to find that world. <laughs> I mean, it's right there. <laughs> and what are we going to show that world? Indifference? So what? You're not going to pay attention anyhow. I'll wait till you ask me something. <laughs> Do you want to know something? They're never going to come to you. <laughs> They're not going to do it. <laughs> so don't wait for them. <laughs> you know all those houses out there? They're never going to come out of those doors and say, will you please come in here? <laughs> oh, man. If you're ever going to see anybody in there, you're going to have to knock on a door. Now, I'm not saying to you that's what God wants you all to do. I think it would be a nice thing for us to get used to, but he doesn't require that of all of us. There are different ways to approach people. There are different settings the Lord has in mind. We may get to some of the more down-to-earth uh, part of this real quick here. We are to be always out watching for opportunities, however. I'm going to read this because it may be familiar and we need it in this setting. Page 28, confusion fills the world and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. Terror, did she really use that word? <laughs> Terrorism, terrorist, terror. She said that great terror is going to soon come upon the whole world, and you can't stop it, friends. I don't care how many people declare war on it. Nobody can stop it. This is coming. We who know the truth, should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Now that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> A terror that's going to break as an overwhelming surprise on the rest of the world. And we know... Yet I was just thinking this morning, these things hit me just the same way they hit you. <laughs> I read these things and they just shatter my brain and tell me, oh, what are you doing? We have some new people that just moved in down the street. And I'm, already, I'm trying to figure out how to <laughs> work it so we know them. But, you know, I'm thinking too hard. I should, we've already talked. We know each other and so forth. That's the first step. But my mind is telling me now, you know, just start talking to them about serious things and see where it goes right away. Because if I don't talk to them, I know that somewhere down history, they're going to look at me and they're going to say, you know, you knew a lot of things about what was coming to this world. And we moved in close to you. We talked to each other. We had an opportunity to find out certain things. And you never said anything to us. And now we're lost eternally. You know, I don't want to face that. <laughs> I just, it's just... <laughs> But we all of us have to start thinking it through. What's coming? What do I owe this person or that person? At least a chance, something. The Lord, I'm quoting, 
the Lord Jesus is calling for self-denying workers to follow in his footsteps, to walk and to work for him, to lift the cross and to follow where he leads the way. That's pretty plain. That's what he's looking for. <laughs> That's what he wants. That's what he desires. What are we going to say to him? We need to decide it. Nobody can force us to do anything. We need to just really set some priority time to decide some things. Day by day, these souls are deciding whether they're going to have eternal life or eternal death. And yet men and women professing to serve the Lord are content to occupy their time and attention with matters of little importance. They are content to be at variance with one another. <laughs> You got anybody in this church you don't like? Watch out. <laughs> you got somebody in the church goading you not to like somebody? That's from the devil. I'm telling you. You better see what that is. Everyone would be standing at his post of duty, working with heart and soul as a missionary of the cross of Christ. They would receive their directions from Christ and they would find no time for strife or contention. <laughs> see, when I see people you know, fussing with each other. I know, they're not being out there soul winning. <laughs> you can't do soul winning and get involved with that too. <laughs> People want to have meetings criticizing the church. Well, I know they don't have anything better to do with their time. I know they're not doing something for God. You know, you have no idea how many groups have asked me to join with them. Join us. I've heard that so many times. You know, we're the good guys. We're, we're the ones doing it right. We're the, we're the real Seventh-day Adventists. We're the, oh. And they, they always end up with, join us. And I always have to tell them the same thing. Why in the world should I join you? I have Jesus already. Earnest, purified words would be spoken. Humble, heartbroken intercession would ascend to heaven. Now there's a scripture over in Proverbs that you may not have looked at lately. It's a tremendous scripture and I haven't thought about it for a long time. But there it was sitting, Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. Just, just see if it really fits right here. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn into death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, I knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keeps thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Hmm. Huh? Well, I didn't know they wanted to know. <laughs> I didn't know they had an interest in eternal salvation. It says, well, yeah, but when I look into your heart, what am I going to see? Oh, what a scripture. Proverbs 24. And that's been in the Bible a long time.
Well, I don't have enough time here to do what I wanted to do for today, but so we'll go over to volume six of the testimonies. Page 362. Yeah, I can see that what I wanted to do is going to take about three times. <laughs> okay, let's continue here. This is talking about Sabbath. What, 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 how come we come to church on Sabbath? What do we do that for? Uh, what is Sabbath for as, in terms of our meetings? What, what's supposed to be happening there? Let's look at just a few things there. One of the reasons that we come to church according to what God has revealed here Every true worshiper who keeps holy the Sabbath should claim the promise that you may know I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Exodus 31, 13. So that's one of the reasons we can know that we serve the God who sanctifies. And then she says under inspiration, that the sermons that are preached in church should be short. <laughs> okay? No long sermons, short sermons. And she says the time should be spent in church allowing the people to express their gratitude and adoration. Now, I have an idea what happened through the years and why we do what we do today. I know initially the time was given for this. But after you spend a couple weeks sitting there and nobody says anything, you begin to wonder, why should I make this, this time available? Nobody says anything. <laughs> That's part of the problem. We need to have something to say. And that doesn't come because somebody said, you have five minutes now. You know, it's interesting that Ellen White, when she was a young girl, and they would have these meetings where people would stand up and talk or even just pray, you couldn't get her to say a word. <laughs> she was so timid. She was so shy. Nobody could get her to do anything. She would just sit there. And then the story goes on that after she realized that God loves her and she was converted to Christ, the next time they had one of those meetings, they couldn't keep her still. <laughs> oh, she was telling about her wonderful Savior. <laughs> and those people just had to watch her and say, look at that. <laughs> Something's happened here. <laughs> We're going to have those kinds of meetings again. We're going to have them. I look forward to God building his people and, and bringing Christianity back. It's, it's coming. He has promised he's going to do it. But he's going to do it on these principles. People love him and love each other. Well, I'm not going to continue through that part of it. It says here, give them food from the Word. Not travelogues, not where did I go, where did I build houses. From the Word. Give them food from the Word. And now I'm sorry to say this one because we've all done it. But it's right here, so I have to read it. <laughs> I could let you go home and read it by yourself, but you might miss it. <laughs> let none come to the place of worship to take a nap. <laughs> no, I know we all get drowsy. We all eat certain things, and they put us down. And 
there's certain kinds of food they kick in there. <laughs> but you have to make up your mind. God told me not to go to church and take a nap. <laughs> he told me. <laughs> so we've got to get that one worked out. She, may, she adds an interesting little thing here. She says, you know, when you're at work, when you're doing your job, you don't take a nap. <laughs> you don't fall asleep when you're working. <laughs> and you know, she's got us. <laughs> what can you say to that? I have never taken a nap while I'm working on somebody. <laughs> And then she makes this little statement just in passing. It's that long, and then it goes by, and she never says it again. And I have built an entire theological understanding on that. Here it is. All heaven keeps the Sabbath. I've had so many people tell me it's only for this earth. That's not what she just said. I've had some mighty big theologians tell me the Sabbath is only for man. No way! The angels keep the Sabbath. The unfallen worlds keep the Sabbath. And we keep the Sabbath. So who's the minority? Sabbath keepers or Sunday keepers? <laughs> What, what, what is this feeling inferior stuff? All the angels keep the Sabbath. <laughs> and of course, God keeps the Sabbath. So, when do the angels and when do all the worlds keep the Sabbath? When God does. When does God keep it? Seventh day, measured by earth time. Don't you realize that someday the earth is going to be the center of the universe? God is going to move this whole planet across the world. Space. Who knows where heaven is right now, but he's going to move the earth right there, and he's just going to step over, and now earth is headquarters. <laughs> mm. We make things so complicated. We don't need to do it. Just read what it says. <laughs> um, the sentence, by the way, you could probably read that chapter and miss that sentence. That's why I want to tell it to you right here. So you can see it. Make your eye look at it. All heaven keeps the Sabbath. <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful thought. When we come together on Sabbath, she says, don't come together just as a matter of form, just to come and sit in church and listen to a pastor and sing the songs and all that. No, no, no. That's not what we're here for on Sabbath. Here's what we're here for. We are here for the interchange of thought. We're supposed to be talking to each other. What about? Our daily experiences. And what are our daily experiences? Well, I went to the hockey game. No, that's not what we're talking about. I spent $500 this week. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. Your daily experience with Jesus. What did you and Jesus do together? That's what we're supposed to be doing on Sabbath here. And then she talks about people who stay away from certain things because they just don't want to be involved. She says, never think you can be a Christian and yet withdraw yourself within yourself. You know, we are creatures. And God has made us to fit in the creation. We all have our spot in that creation. And everything works as long as everybody lives where God made them to live, doing what God made them to do. 
And we need each other. Because if you aren't filling your spot, and you aren't filling your spot, you're going to make it tough for me to do my spot. <laughs> we all have to be doing what God made us for. And so in the church, every church member is important. Every church member is valuable. And when people start going haywire, we need to say some things to try to help them. And when we go haywire, we should listen when somebody talks to us. <laughs> yes. We need each other. You know, when a person says, I'm getting out of that church because, oh, they have error in it. I'm going over here by myself now, and I'm going to get a couple people who agree with me. You know what that person is doing? They are totally disrupting the creation of God. They are destroying the plan of salvation. But they're the good guys. Eventually, those kinds of people will not listen to discipline from anybody. They live only to themselves, and they have made themselves a devil. Because the devil is the supreme independent. We are all dependent and submissive to each other. We couldn't last five seconds in these meetings if we weren't that way with each other. <laughs> now, we don't have to take anything that everybody says and say, hey, that's, that's the way it is, that's the truth. No, but we listen to each other and we wait to see what the Spirit tells us and see how does this all work with each other. And we grow and we develop that way. We are the body. There's only one body. All right, I need to start wrapping up here. We must carry to every religious gathering a quickened spiritual consciousness that God and his angels are there. So look around, would you please? And try to figure out where they are. There are angels everywhere here. Real, live, holy angels. At least one for each of us, probably two. And the Father is here by His Spirit also. The Sovereign of the universe is here with us. One time in that little church in San Diego, we had a communion service. And now as a brand new pastor, and I didn't know what it was to do pastor things. I just did whatever it seemed right for me to do. <laughs> and uh, our first communion service, we gathered in a hall. It wasn't even our church. We were renting it. And when we were in that hall, I set a special chair aside. A big stuffed chair. And we set up tables and chairs and things all around. And we did different things at that communion service. But the one thing I'm talking about here is that chair. When we all came into that room, I said, please leave that chair vacant. Nobody touch that chair. You said every place else, leave that chair. So when everybody was seated and we were all ready to do the service, after prayer, I said, okay, folks, I want you to focus your attention on that chair because the Lord Jesus has promised that he is going to be present with us at this communion. He has promised. He cannot break that promise. So in order to help you out to know where he is, he's in that chair. <laughs> yeah. And I just told him, we know he's going to honor us. He's going to be there. He never said, you can't know where I am. He never said that. So we're going to fix it so we do know where he is. <laughs> and we had a very solemn communion service. We all 
knew the presence of Jesus Christ was there. No games. All right, I want to finish with this. We come to the worship service in the beauty of holiness. And we look at all the believers around us and what we should see is stones, rocks, taken out of the cleaver, with the cleaver of truth, out of the quarry of the world. And you know, I like that picture. She didn't say, God used a Dremel tool. <laughs> Yanked us out of the world, the mighty cleaver of truth. And I thought that was really a, a, a nice imagery. He says, we've been taken as stones. And then she says this. But, oh, there it is again. But, but even in the rough, they are precious in the sight of God. The axe, the hammer, <laughs> and the chisel. A trial are in the hands of one who is skillful. But she, there are no dainty tools, sir. <laughs> if you feel like somebody's using an axe on you, it's because it, they are. <laughs> it's an axe, it's a hammer, it's a chisel. And when God finds the, finally gets you in the shape that he had in mind, then he can begin the polishing. <laughs> and he's going to end up with a jewel. But we all are going through the same thing. And we all need to know he told us what he's doing <laughs> and how it works. All right. We close then. Uh, no sinner... Does the child of God approach the mercy seat that he becomes the client of the great advocate? At his first utterance of penitence and appeal for pardon, Christ espouses his case and makes it his own, presenting the application before the Father as his own request. So whenever you say something to the Father that you need, you want, you have to have, he doesn't hear it as coming from you only. He hears it as coming from Jesus. Jesus said, this is what I want for me. <laughs> and the Father has never turned down Jesus. We need to know that this is something that is so intimate and so close. <laughs> it's happening. We mentioned it before, and I'll say it just now, that when you enter into prayer to the Father... Through the name of Jesus, through his character, you have entered the chamber of God himself, and it's just the three of you. Yeah. You are there with the Godhead. That's what the plan of salvation is all about. God desires his obedient children to claim his blessing and to come before him with praise and thanksgiving. He desires to have a stronger expression from his people. All right, we have a start. Let's see where we go next time. <laughs> Father, how that should ring with us. Father, Abba. We have all of us just now entered in with you into that secret place in the universe with the Father and the Son. 